Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about uh, BPA and plastics and we're also going to open up discussion between other types of chemical compounds. I think in healthcare, you know, there's been an emphasis when you look at toxic chemicals where everyone's really focused on things like mercury and lead. And then there's everyday chemicals that we get exposed to all the time that really have effects on us, especially over time. And, you know, it's important to really consider sometimes some um, strategies to decrease your chemical load overall to maintain your health, just like you would decrease um, strategies to reduce sugar or uh, inflammatory foods or cigarette smoke or whatever it may be to improve your health. Now, um, as most people know, uh, BPA and plastics have gotten a lot of attention for being uh, toxic and producing health problems. And in states like California, they have to actually put on labels or uh, in, in products that have BPA in them that this can cause some potential issues with reproductive health. And for most people that have BPA exposure, they don't really notice any symptoms at all. But when you're looking at um, cases or people that are suffering from things like infertility, people that have chronic inflammation or have autoimmune disease or uh, parents are working with children that may have some developmental disorder conditions, then trying to reduce your overall plas plastic burden can be very important. So one of the first things to understand about plastic products is that they contain a chemical called bisphenol A. And bisphenol A has been found to uh, be what's called an endocrine disrupting chemical. It also is being classified more recently as what's called an obesogen chemical, um, which means that it can help promote um, dysfunction and metabolism to make it easier to gain weight. And um, there's research that shows that it's a major um, factor in immune activation. And I've actually published several scientific papers on my own research with bisphenol A, which I'd like to share with you. But let's just go over how we get these exposures to BPA. So BPA um, is really found in plastic, uh, plastic products. So the most common source is plastic bottles. If you ever look at the receipt, um, you get the ink on receipt paper is bisphenol A. They, they quote inside of cans with bisphenol A. Um, there was actually a Harvard School of Public Health study where they had people just consume two cans of tomato soup a day. And over a very short period of time, they saw their BPA levels went up dramatically. Um, and, you know, people also get a, an extreme amount of exposure to BPA from drinking through coffee lids. And so plastic, plastic, uh, plastic uh, products and even tin cans um, that are coated with BPA is really the most common source of exposure. So we all get exposure. And then biomonitoring studies done in the U.S. have found elevated levels of BPA in about 93% of the population. And, you know, the question comes up like, so what? Well, let's talk about that. Well, first of all, the key thing to remember is that we all get exposure, but we can also, and, and, and it's also unavoidable to completely reduce your exposure to BPA. However, when you look at chemicals and you look at inflammatory conditions and autoimmune diseases, there's something to be said about chemical load. And chemical load can have a significant impact on people that have vulnerability. And the main vulnerable groups to BPA are going to be, again, um, people suffering from infertility, people suffering from um, altered metabolism, um, uh, uh, people that have difficulty with, let's say, losing weight, people that have thyroid disorders, people that have autoimmune diseases. These are the groups where BPA could be a more of an issue than, let's say, other people. Now, when you look at BPA, there's a couple of things to understand about how, how much BPA gets released in something, right? So if you take a plastic bottle and you have something that's very acidic in the plastic bottle, then that, that product is going to have much more BPA. So when you look at, for example, uh, soda, like Mountain Dew or um, Coke or Pepsi or whatever, those uh, liquids are very, very acidic. Um, you don't really taste the acid, but they're actually much more acidic than apple cider vinegar or even vinegar itself. It's just there's so much sugar in there that you don't notice it. But things like soda have an extremely low pH, and that low pH will cause more BPA to be released. So if you look at food products, things like ketchup, which are very, very acidic, um, they will have a greater potential to have more BPA in it because of their acidity. 
So that's one factor. And then heat is another one. So for example, like a heated Mountain Dew bottle at a gas station uh, is probably going to have a lot of bisphenol A and BPA in it. And sometimes when you uh, drink bottled water that's been in a hot uh, environment, like inside of your car or something, you can actually taste some of those BPA chemicals. You can actually taste that plastic. If you can taste the plastic, you're getting a tremendous amount of BPA into your system. So what does BPA do? Well, BPA um, has some significant impacts. So let's talk about its role as an endocrine disruptor first. And numerous studies have clearly shown that bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor. So what that means is BPA can actually uh, disrupt different endocrine signaling pathways. And the two main pathways are estrogen pathways and thyroid pathways. And BPA has been shown to uh, bind to estrogen receptors. And when BPA binds to estrogen receptors, it competes with actual estrogen binding to estrogen receptors. So for some people, the, the binding on certain tissues can make them have less estrogenic effect. And for other people, when it binds to BPA, it can actually activate the estrogenic response. response. So um, it can go both ways. And there's, there's lots of variables that impact how the estrogen receptor res responds to it. But it, you definitely don't want to have environmental chemicals that can bind to your own estrogen receptors in your body. And that's one of the key issues with BPA. And with a lot of the animal studies they did do with B, that have been done with BPA, it's, it's been a major cause of infertility. And they can actually induce infertility in animal studies when they compare it um, with dosing different animals with BPA compared to controls. Um, obviously, we have limitations in human studies that can be done because of <laughs> ethics and taking a group of humans and giving them high amounts of BPA exposure to determine if they get infertility or not um, in a clinical trial is has not been done. There have been other types of study designs. But we do know that BPA is an endocrine disruptor. So, that's, so you definitely want to look at your BPA load if you're having any issues with infertility or any kind of estrogenic uh, imbalance issues. Now, BPA has also been shown to disrupt thyroid hormone production and thyroid hormone synthesis, so it makes the thyroid less efficient to do its normal jobs. So if you have a subtle thyroid issue, you definitely want to, you want to decrease your BPA load. And then BPA has been shown to um, act as what's called an obesogen chemical. So there's a, you know, a list of chemicals that have been shown to slow down metabolism, and BPA is one of them. So for people that have like really sluggish metabolism, um, you really want to consider reducing your BPA load. Now, BPA has also been shown to stimulate the immune system. And there's a pub paper that I published in the journal Autoimmune Disease uh, back, I think, in 2014, where I reviewed all the different mechanisms that have been published and how BPA triggers inflammatory responses. And in particular, my, recent, my review paper that I published was focused on autoimmunity. So BPA turns on inflammatory pathways for autoimmune uh, diseases. Uh, BPA can um, dis cause dysfunction in cells in the immune system that calm down autoimmunity inflammation. So you know, it does all the things you don't want if you have an autoimmune disease. And there was a, a study that I also published where we showed um, people that have BPA binding antibodies. So when you ingest BPA, it, it can bind to your own protein and then change the protein and that protein can become a new antigen and cause triggers. So there was a study that we conducted and we published in the uh, Journal of Applied Toxicology where we show that when people start to have chemical reactions to BPA that they have a high degree of um, correlation and risk for neurological autoimmunity. We then did a follow-up study uh, last year where we looked at patients that can't clear BPA um, some people can't metabolize BPA very effectively, and we use Parkinson's disease patients. Parkinson's disease patients don't have the ability to clear BPA very well, and we found that they had significant risk for lab markers that then are associated with early Parkinson's development, which were what are called alpha sucan antibodies. So, so BPA is, is a major inflammatory immune trigger. It's an endocrine receptor, and it's an obesogen. So, you know, the question is, like, what do you do? Uh, how do you deal with the loads? What kind of factors, what kind of things can you use to do it? How do you, how do you apply this information? So <clears throat> I think the key thing to understand is that um, not everyone's going to have the same reaction to BPA. So the first thing is just because you get the exposure to BPA, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have all these health problems. However, um, it's not good. <laughs> you know, it's just like uh, cigarette smoke isn't good, but it doesn't mean if you get exposed to cigarette smoke, 
you know, you're going to end up with lung cancer. However, uh, people that get chronic exposure to secondhand smoke do have increased risk. So I think people that get chronic exposure to high loads of BPA with certain susceptibilities are going to probably have some, some risk factors associated with it. So when you look at uh, BPA, your body has to metabolize it and clear it out. So um, this pathway that's called biotransformation or what people call detoxification in the liver is how we get rid of BPA. And this pathway is dependent upon uh, a pathway called glucuronidation, a pathway called sulfation, and a pathway called uh, glutathione conjugation. And these pathways are extremely dependent upon a high antioxidant precursor load. So eating lots of vegetables, uh, having lots of antioxidants, having healthy amounts of glutathione, even taking uh, things like n acetylcysteine and glutathione can be very important to clearing up BPA. Now, you also want to look at uh, reducing your household exposure to BPA. Now, if you, if you can, you have to definitely avoid um, drinking out of plastic bottles. Um, if you can get a glass container, a glass bottle, or even like a Yeti with a metal container and just fill that up every day and drink out of that, that can tremendously reduce your load. You definitely want to avoid drinking through coffee lids. I mean, always take the coffee lid off if you're going to drink something and just drink out of that. Or use plastic coffee container, I mean, a glass, uh, plastic, uh, I mean, sorry, glass uh, coffee containers or steel ones um, to really uh, reduce your load. So the key thing when you're looking at BPA, and if you do have vulnerability to some of these conditions like autoimmune disease, infertility, chronic inflammation, is to just reduce your load. So um, using non-plastic items in your home is really important. If you use glass Tupperware containers where it's made out of glass, I mean the top will, will have a plastic seal, but it's really not contacting the food, just keeping the air out. So you really want to make that transition into uh, those types of, um, of compounds. Now, when you're looking at uh, some interesting things about BPA, one of the other things that's important is how it, how it uh, can be a trigger for some people and not for other people. So we did a study also that we published in the, the Journal of Applied Toxicology where the title of the paper was Elevated Levels of uh, antibiotics against xenobiotics in healthy subjects. And we took 400 uh, human subjects and we measured how many of them, we, we stratified it to reflect the U.S. population. And we, we wanted to see how many of them had not BPA levels in their blood, uh, but if they had antibodies to BPA. And in the study, we found 13% of the people had antibodies to BPA, which means that when some people get exposure to BPA, they actually have an immune response against it. Now that's really interesting because when they look at urine levels of BPA, they find over 90% of people in the U.S. have very high levels of BPA in their urine. And then what we found in our study is that we only had 13% having these antibodies. So there's a big difference between just having high levels and having antibodies. So there are some people that get exposed to BPA and develop antibodies against BPA. And, and uh, those people, uh, on further research we did, found that BPA can be a major trigger for basically uh, well, all the major autoimmune diseases uh, in our in-house testing, but the ones we published so far have really been on neurological autoimmune diseases. But it can definitely be a factor with things like thyroid or other conditions uh, as well. So that's one of the key differences. And one of the key things that can impact that is just how your immune system responds to environmental chemicals. So if you already notice you're sensitive to environmental chemicals, like you notice your skin is reacting when you put on lotions, you can't handle gasoline fumes, you can't handle different types of scents, um, you, you definitely want to reduce your chemical load and you may be at greater risk for having these, these chemical antibody reactions as well. So I've also written some articles on BPA on my website um, uh, and some of the information about the research that we've done. And published at Dr. K News, drknews.com. And we talk about um, some programs related to what's called immune tolerance. And immune tolerance is one of the things that avoids a person from starting to react against chemicals. And we have an online course about that, so you can, you can take a look at those things at our website. But those are the key things about BPA. And I think for myself, the reason I wanted to do this talk was as a researcher, uh, I've published several papers on, on this and I have a lot of interest in this personally. 
um, as it relates to autoimmune disease. And secondly, what I've seen happen with lots of patients that have chronic autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammation, if they're so focused on limiting their diet with food protein, so they go gluten-free, dairy-free, autoimmune paleo, they keep histamine free they keep cutting out every single food and they make no real attention to reducing their chemical load and the most abundant and commonly exposed chemical that is very inflammatory and can really cause problems is is just this chronic exposure to BPA and taking simple steps uh, to just reduce your load uh, even by let's say 50 percent or 60 percent can have a tremendous impact on overall inflammation and in in those types of factors as well so you know people you know always ask hey, how do you totally avoid it and like again i said you can't totally avoid it you just want to try to reduce your load we kind of live in a world where you, you have some degree of exposure with those as well so those are the key things about bpa now i also want to point out there's been a lot of new interest in what's called bpa free products and bpa free products are uh, really just as bad and instead of using bisphenol A, they're using bisphenol S. And bisphenol S in studies are now showing it's just as bad as BPA. And some studies are showing that's even worse, that it's having a greater uh, endocrine disrupting effect in, in, uh, than actual bisphenol A. So when you read things that say um, BPA free and it's plastic, it's still just as bad. And now you have some people marketing things they put on their products labels like non-toxic plastic, but the, the plastic they're using is B, BPS. That's starting to change because the studies are showing them being published on BPS, showing that it's that is uh, toxic. And as soon as uh, more studies show up on BPS, then they're going to have BPA and BPS free, and they'll use another derivative or, or subfraction of BPA, and it'll be the same issues. So um, the takeaway tips as we take into questions here is. When you're looking at uh, um, BPA, definitely stop drinking out of plastic bottles. If you're using plastic containers and anything that's acidic like ketchup, try to use glass instead. Try to use glass containers or metal containers like a Yeti or, or different containers that are popular these days to drink out of it. If you use Tupperware in your hose, try to use the glass, the glass types of compounds. If your kids are you're making meals for your kids, try to use those metal food trays that they can take to school with them and bring back. Those are the ways to really reduce your load. Okay, so with those, um, that kind of being the background, I can try to take some questions if people have any um, and kind of go from there. Okay, one of the things someone has asked is, can you put a, can you put a please put up a link to providers? And uh, I think Susan posted that there's a list of providers that have been training uh, with me my institute called the Crosby Institute. We have uh, almost now 2,000 practitioners throughout the world that are learning the clinical models that I teach. And the ones that are up to date with all the coursework are listed uh, at uh, crosbyinstitute.com. There's a practitioner locator there if you're looking for someone to kind of navigate your way through chronic inflammatory condition with diet, nutrition, lifestyle, medicine approaches. Okay. So okay. let's let's get into some questions. Give it my hand. My wife's here to help me. Oh, can you show me those? I, I have a... Oh, my wife. This, one. this is, a, for example, one of the things... This was given to me by Mark Flannery. This is by a company called Tupkey, T-U-P-K-E-E-Y. But it's a really easy way to just transfer coffee. And the key thing about this is that the lid itself is plastic. Glass! I'm sorry, not <laughs> glass. Oh, my god. Sorry. It's glass. And then... Uh, <laughs> This is a Tupperware. You see, it's it's it's, it's a storage glass container. It's storage, a container. It's storage container. It's the, and then food. this is a glass. The top part, of course, this has to be plastic to seal it. But the food is only really getting exposed to the plastic portion. And this is these are great. I don't know if you use. Uh, I love Yeti, but they have you know these metal containers and they keep everything really cold. And, uh, and this is a very large one. Like you can fill this with water and drink it all day. I use this for myself personally. I try to drink at least three of these a day, big long containers of water. But it's just a great way to avoid this uh, chronic exposure to plastic uh, compounds. Okay, do we have some questions? I do. Okay. Um, you kind of discussed this, but what about bottles and cans that are designated as BPA-free? 
Okay. Yeah, so the, so the bottle and cans that are designated BPA-free are still be BPS. Um, all, all, all cans are coated with this BPA or BPS product. So you're going to get some exposure with that. And like I was telling you, there was a Harvard uh, School of Public Health study where they looked at just having uh, a group of subjects consume two cans of tomato soup a day for a few weeks, and they found a significant increase in their overall BPA levels. So if you're trying to get your BPA levels down, you really want to limit uh, your exposure to canned products as much as possible. And again, uh, it's one of those things where you just try to reduce your load. You're not going to completely uh, avoid it, but it's you know, one of those things. Okay. Um, is there something we do or take to detoxify BPAs? Yeah, so if you're trying to detoxify BPAs, meaning you're trying to improve your body's ability to clear out bisphenol A from your body, um, the, the main pathway is actually uh, glutathione uh, conjugation. And the, the most effective way to raise your glutathione levels and the cheapest way to raise your glutathione levels as far as nutritional supplements goes, just to go and get over-the-counter N-acetylcysteine. And you can take N-acetylcysteine like uh, anywhere between 1,000 or 3,000 milligrams a day to really get a uh, good, good uh, support for your uh, glutathione production pathways. You can actually take things like liposomal glutathione or actual glutathione itself, and uh, those are also great ways to do it. Okay, from Sean, what is the best way to evaluate BPA exposure? Blood, urine, saliva, right. labs? So the way that people are measuring BPA uh, in the clinical settings um, and in research settings is when they're trying to look at BPA load, they're using urine testing. So lots of laboratories uh, have BPA urinary measurement levels. And you can see your levels, they, 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 they're they dynamic. They'll change based on how much exposure that you get. Um, and then the the area of research that I was involved with, um, with Dr. Vajdani, was we looked at bisphenol A, and bisphenol A can bind a protein, and then you can make antibodies against it. And that starts to cause chemical reactivity. And you can also uh, have practitioners order that test. There's a panel through Cyrix Laboratories which checks a very a list of chemicals that that are measured for antibody reactions and a panel through Cyrex Labs called Array 12, I'm sorry, Array 11, will measure these antibody reactions. So for example, if I'm working with people that have an autoimmune disease, I know they're getting exposure to BPA, but I want to know are they getting antibody reactions to BPA. So I'll measure Cyrex Array 11 and if I see that they have high amounts of BPA antibodies, I definitely want to do a few things. I want to try to reduce their overall load by the things we discussed earlier. I want to get them on things to help clear BPA out of their body, like uh, raising their glutathione levels. And then I want to focus on um, trying to improve their immune tolerance so they are not as reactive to chemicals. And there's several articles on online course that Dr. King News that goes into greater depth about that. So that would be the strategy I would use uh, with measuring BPA in my, in my own practice. Okay. Um, did I say is there something we can use to detoxify BPA? Did I ask that? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, dun, dun, dun. Okay, what about plastic Ziploc bags for vegetable storage? Yeah, so if you're using plastic Ziploc bags, I mean, the, the, there's, you're going to get some BPA exposure. Um, but the point is, don't put anything in the, beep, in the plastic bags while it's hot, if you can. Because if you have heat, you get more BPA release. And if you have, for example, some plastic vegetables, you put in a you put in a plastic bag, and it and it's, and it's cold, and it's in the refrigerator. And one of the key things that releases BPA is heat. So if it's not in a hot environment, you're not going to have as much exposure and load. The worst scenario is like an acidic liquid stuck in a can or a plastic bottle for a long period of time. Then you're just going to get a lot of that uh, uh, leaching of BPA into the actual food substance, and that's where it's more problem. So, um, yeah, I think plastic bags are going to be some things we, we all use. You just don't want to take really, really hot food and put it in there because that heat will release the BPA in there. Okay. Um, is there a risk if you, if you empty the water from a plastic bottle into a glass drinking container? So if you empty, if you empty the plastic bottle into a glass container, whatever amount of BPA was that was... Uh, leaked into the water is still going to be there, but at least you're not getting any more, right? 
So that's one thing. Um, the best thing is to have like a nice home filter system and uh, and then have like glass bottles or metal metal containers to store your water in and then drink out of those for the whole day. That'd be your best scenario. But of course, you know, like, uh, listen, if you go to an airport, you can't find anything besides plastic bottles. <laughs> they, they just don't have glass. And again, you, you, there's going to be times where you don't have any other option. But the point is if you have some of these susceptible conditions like autoimmune disease or, or infertility or an inflammatory condition, it's just to reduce your overall load and get in the habit of trying to decrease your exposure to BP as much as you can. So, I mean, there are going to be times where you have no other option and you have to drink out of a plastic bottle, but uh, that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, do you think it's important to have a shower filter slash water filter in your home? I personally think it's really, the question is about shower filter, water filter. I personally think it's really important to have a shower water filter. People always ask, like, what's the best one? And I got to be honest with you, I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, there's a lots of different uh, claims out there, lots of different things out there. You want to really do your investigation and find one that makes sense for you. Um, but it's, it's, it is important to have uh, a filter. Like I know in our home we have a filter for our entire home that anything that comes in water supply comes into a major home filter system and then we have a specific filter for just water itself so we get two layers of filtration before we, we drink it and then we, and then we you know the key thing is drinking water every day our drinking water every day is in a, in a metal container we use like we like our family loves the yeti bottles because we put some ice in there and it just stays you know cold all day yeah okay uh, clean canteen makes a food grade stainless steel beverage bottle too. Clean canteen. Yeah, clean, can, use clean canteen is also another great company. Lunch boxes. That makes lunch boxes. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you read about ozone therapy? And if so, does the literature support its use in chronic viral infections and other chronic conditions? Well, ozone therapy a different topic than um, BPA. Um, you know, there, there isn't, to be quite honest, a lot of information on ozone therapy and, and treatment of, of viral infections. There are definitely practitioners that have anecdotal effects and practice, patients that have anecdotal effects using it. Um, I, I've never used ozone therapy and, there isn't, and I haven't read much about the research on it, so I can't really answer your question very well about it. So, okay. Um, here's one. Sorry. Can you Any comment on or about compounded glutathione spray, like skin on spray? Oh, uh, as far as glutathione spray, I would I would guess it would have a very very hard time getting absorbed because glutathione is a large tripeptide sulfur amino acid. I just can't imagine that getting through the skin. Uh, and even you know glutathione itself is hard to get through the gut barrier. That's why people use an acetylcysteine. Or people have to use a liposomal form of glutathione to to make a difference. So. Um, I would I would be very skeptical to see if a glutathione spray would have any real effect at all, other than surface antioxidant protection, which may be great if you're trying to decrease impacts of oxidation on your skin from a surface level. But as far as getting into your system and and helping biotransformation and a systemic anti-inflammatory response, you, I don't think you'd be able to do it with a spray. Okay, then can, do you still recommend OxyCell? And is for What's the difference? So OxyCell is in the spray. OxyCell is a cream that has glutathione in there. It's liposomal. Liposomal delivery methods allow for absorption into, into tissues. So um, there has to be a compounding pharmacist act, helping support a process to transport something like glutathione through the, through the skin um, as, a, as a way to really support that system. And even even uh, oxycells of glutathione cream is really has benefits on a surface level and tissue level uh, that's more topical than as a raising your astral glutathione with something like an acetylcysteine or liposomal glutathione. Okay. Uh, what? Sorry. What about plastic co composite dental fillings? Do they contribute yeah. to the overall BPA load? How do you address them? Yeah, so that's the other thing. Plastic composite fillings do have BPA load. And here's another thing. The more acidic your saliva pH is, the, the greater release you have. So um, you can always get some saliva pH paper you can get over off Amazon. You can check your pH. And if your pH is really on the acidic side, uh, you can try to change your diet 
to really change your saliva pH to see if you can get a change. Sometimes changing your diet is, is really hard to change your saliva pH because you actually have like bacteria in your mouth or infections that are cha that are causing that acidic environment. But uh, absolutely, um, BPA based fillings uh, can cause ongoing BPA release into the body. Okay. If BPA and BPA-free are both undesirable, should we then just avoid all canned foods? Well, yeah, technically, if you're really <laughs> trying to want to be uh, completely BPA-free, yeah, then don't eat any canned foods. But, uh, again, it's, it's really kind of about overall load. For example, um, you, 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 you're you going to probably get exposed to cigarette smoke here and there, and it's not good but it is kind of the way the world works, especially if you go in different countries where people smoke a lot. But you probably don't want to uh, you know, live with a chronic smoker and expect to be healthy. There's some, some, some different impacts from chronic exposure versus occasional exposure. And remember, here's the thing too, our body is designed to get exposure to toxic chemicals and compounds on a regular basis, and that's why we have biotransformation and detox pathways. So we do have some resiliency. We do have some normal, healthy ability to get rid of chemicals, and this is why not everyone that gets exposed to BPA will get sick. Um, so if your biotransformation pathways are healthy, I mean, we are designed to be able to process a certain degree of chemicals out of our system. The problem becomes you have a huge load, and then you lose your ability for resiliency. So people that have chronic inflammation, people that have chronic autoimmune diseases, um, people that have their biotransformation, their glutathione pathways uh, totally depleted, they're, when they get an increased load, they don't have that system in place to kind of counteract it, and that's where a lot of things go wrong. So if you're somewhat healthy um, and you, you know, you're getting some exposure to chemicals, um, we are designed to be able to deal with that as a species. And uh, so if you occasionally eat some tomato soup or canned soup or drink out a plastic bottle, it may not be as detrimental for you. But when people really um, have some risk factors and then get a load, that's where you want to be concerned. Are beer and soda cans also lined with BPA? Yes. Wow. Beer and soda cans are also lined with BPA. So you're, you're going to get some exposure. So all can, whether it's uh, canned food or beer or soda, or they're all going to have some degree of BPA in it. So yeah. glass would always be best. And, you know, I can tell you, it's, it's really tough to find glass. Um, you go to the grocery store, I mean, you just, you know, my local grocery store, I can't find any water source that is uh, glass. So I have to go to Amazon and, and order <laughs> glass bottles. Uh, sometimes, you know, you just have to take water with you when you go places. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes you just make an effort. Like even ketchup bottles, sometimes ketchup bottles, you have to find the glass ones um, to reduce your load. If you're really trying to, you know, find as many ways you can impact it. Okay. And the other key thing with BPA is you like, you may not necessarily feel dramatically better reducing your chemical load um, on a, an immediate basis, but over a period of time, it can have impacts on health, just like other types of chemical compounds too. It's a cumulative buildup effect that really is the issue. And if you get chronic exposure and load, you're actually depleting your antioxidant levels and uh, you're creating a state of inflammation that uh, may not be good on an ongoing basis. Okay. Um, someone says I was able to raise my glutathione levels with transdermal spray. Her doctor tested for it. You test for that. Great. Yeah, I can't, I can't comment on the transdermal sprays. I don't have any experience, but if you saw your levels raised, then, then something worked great for you. Okay. Um, so we, sorry. What about pool chemicals? Chemicals and pools? Sure. I mean, chemicals and pools, fire retardants, other things, chemicals we get exposed to are, are strategies we should, we should, you know, you can also take. I mean, you have to, you know, we can't get rid of all toxins and chemicals. Even in the soil we have in, and have always had, there's some toxic chemicals. So our body's always been able to clear some of these pathways out. The different, things, the different thing about BPA is that there's a direct connection with BPA to our food supply, to our food sources that we ingest and we drink. And this is where this toxic level becomes much, much worse. So um, 
that's why I really want to make an emphasis on this um, product itself. And it's easy to reduce your load if you just use glass and steel containers for your beverages. That will have a huge. It, it's if you drink, let's say you're a Starbucks fanatic. If you drink Starbucks every day, and you drink through that lid every day, maybe even twice a day. Um, you're going to get a lot of BPA exposure, and if you just cut that one simple thing of taking off the lid, you're going to decrease this this uh, this inflammatory um, compound. And if you do that for many months, then your overall load is going to dramatically come down. So that's why um, this is such an important topic because it's so linked to our exposure to foods and our containers um, that store food. So Rose Reyes asks, what about canned tuna, Dr. K? Canned tuna is going to have aluminum and BPA, <laughs> and uh, um, again, tuna itself is going to have lots of compounds and metals and all that. If you become a chemical, I mean, there's a point where you have to kind of look at pros and cons of chemical exposures. We're going to get some to some level. Um, the, the point of this talk for me was to really try to discuss how how easy it is to reduce your chemical load with some simple strategies and also um, be really aware of BPA free stuff because BPA free stuff is not BPA free. it's 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 just BPS which is just as bad so don't feel like you're having any benefits and if you can get uh, you know the metal containers for your foods for your kids foods that for their lunches and you can use uh, metal containers for beverages on an ongoing regular basis and that just becomes what you do as a household, that would be a tremendous benefit to your family's health, especially over a period of time. Can you detox BPA through infrared sauna? Can you detox BPA through infrared sauna? Um, I, would, I would guess that there's gonna have some impact on infrared sauna on just detoxification to some degree, but I don't have a lot of strong background in that a specific piece of information to answer to f well for you. I would guess that it would have some positive impacts. Okay. Um, what about mouth guards worn at night during yeah. sleep? Yeah, so mouth guards worn at night. Uh, the, so the other key thing with BPA is what I call phthalates. And phthalates are what make plastic softer. So the softer the compound, the softer the plastic, the the greater phthalates you release, and the softer the compound, um, the easier it is to actually breach BPA. So mouth guards are a problem, and just recently they banned BPA from uh, kids' plastic water bottles. They're just using BSA. <laughs> but uh, if you can, if you have to use it, you have to use it. But it would be, it is something that's going to impact total load. So for some people, they may not be able to get rid of their plastic guard at night, but they can reduce their plastic uh, water bottle exposure, right? So the key thing with understanding the, the concept of BPA isn't 100% getting removing all of it, but trying to find out what parts of your lifestyle you can reduce to make it to make an impact for your health. You know, for some of my, some of my patients um, that have autoimmune disease, when we do something like a Array 11 panel from Cyrix where they measure the most common chemical exposure and they have antibodies against it. Sometimes they, this person doesn't show up with BPA, but they show up with fire retardants. And for them, we want them to reduce their fire retardant exposure. So we want them to make sure their mattress isn't sprayed in fire retardants. So they're not sleeping, getting exposed to it every day. Um, they may need to change their furniture. They may, you know, if they're really, really sick and have severe autoimmune disease, they may need to, you know, pull out carpets if they have reactions to, to formaldehydes and things like that to really improve their constant daily exposure to some chemicals but for everyone that may not be necessary because again they're, they're they have a healthy enough biotransformation pathway to metabolize these things out of the body without having negative impacts so it depends on your susceptibility by where you are with your conditions that you may be suffering from or your patients may be suffering from or friends and family and then your overall load that that really is the balancing act so if your child has to wear retainers with this in it, yeah. well, I'm putting a couple questions together, then what can they do to combat that? So if a child has to wear these retainers, then what do you do to combat that? Have more of the retainer. <laughs> Reduce the load however else you can. Supplement and then, wise, right? and then if you want to use supplements, you can you you know have, have take things like N-acetylcysteine um, as a good way, or just glutathione 
um, as a way to support biotransformation and clearance. Okay. Did I ask about this infrared sauna? Infrared sauna? Yeah. Yes, yeah, we well, did not. You did that one? Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, this is kind of funny. Is the squishier the plastic, like the softer the plastic, Yeah. is it worse than yes. hard plastic? Yes. The softer the plastic, the worse it is, not even just for the BPA, but for the phthalate components. So phthalates are what's soft and plastic, and they have their own endocrine disrupting effects. So the softer the plastic, the, the worse effect. So softer plastic that in combination with an acidic compound in combination with heat is terrible. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of these chefs are now taking like foods and they're uh, putting them in a plastic container and the food's already acidic because let's say it's a tomato or something and then they heat it and then now they get the phthalates and all those. And again, if you have a Michelin star chef cook that for you on a special dinner for our anniversary, you're probably going to be okay. But that constant exposure, to that, that type of act behavior can really increase your load. So people are a little confused. Some saying, I thought plastics were okay as long as you don't heat them or cold freeze them. Sure. So plastics, um, overall plastics, um, the word okay is just dep depends how you define it. Okay. So it depends on how you define it as okay. If you don't heat plastics and, and the plastics aren't storing something that is acidic, you're not going to have as much release, okay? You're still going to have release. So um, that's why you always still want, if you're trying to reduce your BPA load, you definitely want to move to steel or glass to make a difference. Even ceramic would be a good option. Yeah. Okay. And is there a way to determine how well detox pathways are working? Is there a way to determine? Yes, you can, you can do um, urinary BPA load. I mean, just measure urinary BPA. And then if you're taking things to help detoxify BPA, like lots of glutathione and sweating and whatever things you want to do, you should actually see, in very early cases, your BPA levels in urine rise because you're clearing them out. And then over a period of time, you should see it go down. The best approach is to really reduce your load in combination with um, taking things like glutathione, uh, and to really see the effect on your body. Okay, um, and people are asking, this happened a lot, does it help to transfer foods to glass that came in plastics? Yeah, so does it help to transfer foods to foods that came in plastics into glass? Yes, so it's just like the, the water scenario that's in a plastic bottle. Once you transfer it to glass, you won't get any more BPA released into the food product, okay? And if it's, it's in glass, then whatever was there before is, is now in the glass. So if you're going to store it, it would make sense. If you just, you know, eat it right away, obviously, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, make, it wouldn't make any sense to do that. But the food has already leached the plastic. Yeah, the, the food's already leached into the plastic if you, if you get it in, in the storage form of plastic. And also, like, for example, um, like you look at deli meats, like whenever if I eat, like let's say sometimes I'll travel, I'll have to use deli meats to kind of on a plane because I don't eat gluten or dairy, and I'll and I'll get some salami and and it'll be in slices. I'll at least take the top and bottom layer off and throw it away. <laughs> so I don't want the BPA that's been touching against that for a long time into my food product. So then I'll eat the rest of the rest of the meats. <laughs> so that's okay. So you mentioned briefly um, about um, obesogenic effects of BPA. Can yes. you please elaborate a little more? Yeah. So there's a field. Um, there's a field of research looking at chemicals and how they slow down metabolism and, and uh, they call the obesogens. And obesogens um, um, are basically chemicals that for the most part are endocrine disrupting chemicals. And uh, plastics are starting to get categorized as an obesogen, which means for certain people, and, and it's not for everyone, but there's just very people that are very susceptible to it. So you may notice if you have sluggish metabolism and you make an effort to reduce your plastic load that you do see some changes in your metabolism. You wouldn't expect to go reduce your BPA load and all of a sudden you lose 10 pounds, but you may notice that Sorry. some things may be easier. And if, if that is happening to a theory, theoretical model is that those constant BPA exposures, um, those chemicals that bind to endocrine, to your thyroid or to even estrogen receptors are paying it, playing a factor in slowing down how efficient your body can burn body fat. So that's where the obesogen model comes in with environmental chemicals. Okay. Um, there's 
a company, it's called Sous Vide, it's just a cooking company, and they put their foods in plastic, Yeah. and then they come to you and then you cook them. Oh, in the plastic? In the plastic, like what? Bad idea. And they're saying, so it's saying um, the cooked meats in plastic Sous bags, they're cooked in lower heat water, is that still bad? It's, it's, well, it's heated, the, high, the, the more heat you have, the greater release you have, but lower heat is still going to cause a release. If you're getting foods delivered to your house in plastics, and then they ask you to cook it in plastics, talk about increasing BPA load. If that's how you're eating regularly, you're, you're definitely increasing your BPA load. It's just the opposite of everything you want to do. And if you have an inflammatory autoimmune disease, uh, or infertility, or some kind of endocrine dysfunction and balance, um, that's not a good idea. Okay. Um, what about children's plastic toys? Children's plastic toys have BPA, and there's been a strong effort where people try to remove it, and they're now switching to BPA, BS, BPS, which is a, which is what some people are concerned about. And um, yeah, if they stick it in their mouth, they're going to get exposure. But again, remember we have some resiliency to clear these things out. So, so this so BPA isn't classified as a poison. Let me explain. What is classified as a poison is something that kills us, <laughs> and things that kill us are things that our body cannot clear out through biotransformation pathways, um, and they they disrupt our cells of mitochondria and and cause death and toxic effects. Now, rat poison as an example, is vitamin D, because rats can't process vitamin D. So when they eat it, it has a toxic effect on them and they die. BPA is not necessarily a toxic substance where we're going to get death from exposure, but BPA is an endocrine disrupting chemical. So it's not a poison, it's an endocrine disrupting chemical, and it's an inflammatory based chemical. So it's all about a cumulative effect. So you do want to reduce it, but we do have some exposure to it, and this is where metabolism and trying to clear it out becomes becomes useful for us. Okay. Um, sorry. Let's see. People ask me about just different water filters to use. Different water filters again. I'm, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, which ones are the best ones? You know, the problem is we don't have any oversight in people that are making these water filters and different. There's, there's not an independent group trying to see if the filters are really doing with the things they do. And any information they give you is in-house studies. So the, so we don't have um, really strict evaluations of how these water filters are actually working. That's the problem we have. So it's hard to know this is the one to use because you don't know if their claims are real. That's That's the issue. Okay, let's see. As far as determining which is the best one, I should say. Any home test for glutathione or NCA levels? Any home test? Well, I don't know if you can do home tests for glutathione and NCA levels. You have to can do laboratory work where they look at the ratios of reduced to oxidized glutathione as a lab test. Um, and uh, they're quite expensive. And I don't know if they tell you much more information than you need. Ultimately, um, you, you should probably look at reducing your inflammatory load anyways and uh, if you're trying to just overall take a daily antioxidant taking glutathione and NAC may be a pretty good idea because levels of glutathione also are dynamic they can change from day to day they can change all the time so that so uh, you could have your oxidized and reduced glutathione levels high normal one week and then you get exposed to lots of environmental chemicals and stressors and have inflammation for whatever the triggers may be and have a, this plummet within a very short period of time so since they're so dynamic and, and changing all the time and they're not cheap, I don't personally think they're, they're that useful in a, in a real clinical setting um, because of the cost benefit and the, the, the great amount of fluctuations you see with them. Okay, so people are saying um, silicone, like silicone containers and spatulas and stuff are BPA free. Are those safe to use? No. Okay. <laughs> if it's plastic and it's flexible and silicone. it moves, it's, there's there are there's uh, phytate uh, phthalates in there, and there's BPS and other types of compounds that are endocrine disrupting. If it feels like plastic, looks like plastic, it's not good. Yeah, that's just the the, the bottom line. So what do you use in your kitchen? What do I use? I showed you. <laughs> no, for oh. like spatulas and stuff. 
So we use we try to use metal whenever we can. Uh, so we have like a metal spatula. We, we use a wooden one. But we don't. Yeah, in our family we do have virtually no uh, plastic utensils or cooking gears or things like that. I showed you the, top, the glassware we use, the coffee we drink out of, the um, uh, Yeti metal containers we use, and that's what we use in our household. And, the, and my wife has been great at really reducing the plastic load in our house. But there's some effort, and now it's just normal to us. Now we're just used to doing that. And and I, and I think of my, uh, my, my daughters. My daughter is, uh, you know, she's about to go to high school. And I just look at her development and look at those the simple changes that my wife made over all these years has made a dramatic impact on her talk, chronic exposure to BPA and plastic compounds that are not only endocrine receptors, but they're pro-inflammatory. So I see it as just a very simple change that you just put some effort into that can really make some long-standing benefits of, of reducing an inflammatory compound. Well, thank you, but you and Dr. Vijani freak me out, so I... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, our spatula is, it's, I think it's called a fish spatula. Oh, okay. And it's, it's got like, it's, you get it sort of the top and it's really flexible, but it's metal. Yeah. Okay. So we use a fish spatula. I think that's what it's called. So, I it's like, it it's a thing. metal flexible spatula, which makes it easy to use, but it's Someone not, told me it's not plastic. Is. Yeah. And then you use, we use wooden as well. We use wooden. Yeah. To stir stuff. Stir stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, da, da, da. How, okay, if you were able to limit the load, how long would it take to detoxify the body um, to very low levels? Days, weeks, years? Oh, sorry, can I if, it? Sure, thank you. Okay. So this, this, uh, I'll use this as the last question. Um, but uh, the key thing with BPA is that um, if you, would, if you st immediately stop drinking plastic uh, out of uh, plastic water bottles, your BPA levels would drop within. Uh, uh, one or two days, so you can you can have a significant change in your urinary BPA levels with just removing sources pretty quickly. So that lets us also know how dynamic our BPA levels are. When we get exposure, our levels go up, and, and then you get these types of changes. So um, I hope that information helped. Um, and again, just to kind of summarize some of the key points uh, that I really want to share with you, the key things are. Our body has resiliency and the ability to get rid of toxic chemicals. We get exposed to toxic chemicals and various uh, me chemical metabolites all the time. So a healthy, highly, a healthy person with healthy amounts of biotransformation is going to get exposed to things like BPA and fire retardants and really have no problems because of how well our bodies are in, in metabolizing these things. However, there are some subgroups that have less resiliency in their biotransformation pathways or, or have a chronic inflammatory condition or have some endocrine metabolism disorders where BPA can be a bigger issue for them. And for people that have autoimmune disease or chronic systemic inflammation or for people that have uh, children with childhood developmental disorders, um, then trying to reduce this one key factor in your lifestyle by, by not totally avoiding but reducing your load can be tremendously beneficial. I know in my own practice, I've worked with autoimmune disease patients, like uh, for example, I get, use an example, Hashimoto's patient that comes in, they're on the autoimmune paleo, they've cut down every single food, and they're still using high amounts of plastic products, and then you get the lab test back, and they're reacting to BPA, and BPA levels are really high, and that is an ongoing trigger. So if you can make some efforts to, um, uh, clear these things out of your system that could be helpful. Please check out uh, Dr. K News. We have some information articles about BPA. And if you want to also uh, reduce your reaction to chemicals, you can look at improving your immune tolerance. We have some articles in an online program about um, immune re immune tolerance that are listed there for you uh, if you have interest in that. And I hope this information is useful to you and maybe a reminder to, 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 to spend a little bit of effort to find uh, how to make your house uh, um, less BPA dominant and go from there. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Thank you.